Michael, uh, and also Director of Waste Institute that is uh, sponsoring this event. This is a, an event that's particularly dear to my own heart for a couple of reasons. I've been teaching at Edinburgh Law School for 20 years, but I'm actually a graduate of Edinburgh University, Glasgow University, excuse me. So <laughs> the tension between these two uh, great institutions is, is very interesting to me personally, and I think it's also um, a fantastic basis for this kind of engagement. And uh, what I also want to do in the first couple of minutes is to uh, say something about the Mason Institute itself, you know, the, the, um, the, the research centre that's actually allowing this to, 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 to take place, and also just to lay out some of the considerations in and around this topic um, that we're debating this evening, which is this house believes that parents have an absolute right to know and retain the whole genome of the future child through non-invasive fetal testing. I think it's important for the audience just to lay out some of the considerations which will then be picked up by each of the teams. <coughs> So the Mason Institute is named after Professor John Kenyon Mason, who was the um, Professor of Forensic Medicine here in Edinburgh from the 1970s up until 1985. He then developed a very strong interest in medical law and ethics and moved over to become an honorary fellow in the law school and taught uh, with us in law right up until a few years ago. And as we say here on the Mason Institute banner, what we try to do with the Mason Institute is to continue his commitment to interdisciplinarity, his passion for, for the field, and really try to um, be a centre that brings people together to exchange knowledge, to uh, develop evidence-based investigations at the interface between medicine, life sciences, law, ethics, sociology, lots of these different disciplines, but to go beyond the boundaries of doctrine, beyond the boundaries of these disciplines, to actually make a difference in the real world and to have an impact in social and public life and ultimately for the greater public good. So that's what the Mason Institute tries to do. As I said, what I'd like to do, just to sort of lay out some uh, groundwork here, is to explore <coughs> just some of the, the, the facts behind uh, non-invasive fetal testing. Although, you might have seen in our, our initial um, advert, we called it feral testing, so we managed to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> what is, so I want to start off with, what is non-invasive fetal testing before laying out some of the issues? So, currently, the position is, medically, that a pregnant woman can go along for testing or screening of her fetus in a very targeted way. Um, and that is usually focused on a small number of serious diseases, normally for which something can be done or which will inform um, a termination decision. But the nature of that testing and, and, and screen, because it is invasive, means that it carries certain associated risks and primarily those risks relate to miscarriage. Also, a decision about whether or not to undertake invasive uh, fetal testing is based on a clear risk-benefit ratio because of the risks involved and whether or not the decisions actually merit, merit, merit that type of intervention. Now, in 2012, two separate studies were published which showed um, the proof of principle related to what was called risk-free analysis of cell-free fetal DNA, so CFF DNA. And this is basically um, found in maternal plasma, so you're really talking about a blood test that is uh, non-invasive from, from the, the fetus's point of view, from the, the, the integrity of, of, the, of the mother and, and the womb, and it also shows the proof of principle, the possibility of being able to mark the whole fetal genome. And in, with respect to those two studies, the success rate or the accuracy rate was between 95 and 98% with respect to the fetus's genome. At the moment, however, there are quite significant limitations with respect to what can be done. This is because the current methods available to detect CFF DNA cannot yet distinguish between the maternal and the fetal DNA, which means that the actual testing um, is restricted to determining fetal sex or um, identifying single gene disorders coming from, from the father. But that's just at the moment, because there are also many arguments about associated opportunities with this type of non-invasive uh, intervention with respect to the possibility, in particular, that the whole genome sequence of a fetus could actually be uh, <clears throat> established, and that could detect any of 3,000 single gene disorders, as well as any number of mutations that we currently know, or might come to know, in the future. And all of that could be done with no physical risk to the fetus whatsoever. So the argument is, it is a major potential advance um, in the management of pregnancy and beyond. Finally, we need to consider the cost. The cost in 2012 of carrying out these studies amounted to $50,000, um, which is, is obviously significant. 
But if we compare that with the, the cost for mapping the first human genome, uh, that was $3 billion, whereas now more recently it's been reported that they've got those costs right down to about $1,000. So any current cost concerns about non-invasive fetal testing would arguably rapidly disappear or could be minimised. But still, there's a question of whether or not this type of intervention is likely to be carried out on a commercial basis rather than within, for example, a public health service. So what about the ethical and legal issues that you're going to hear about tonight? <clears throat> well, on the one hand, there is the possibility of an increase in the range of parental choices and informed reproductive decisions that could be taken if this information were actually generated. Equally, if you're talking about generating information about the whole genomic sequence of a fetus and therefore a future person, the volume and the scope of information that's going to, that's going to be uh, uh, brought into being could reveal findings with unknown clinical utility. You don't know what significance it has for the health of the person. And or non-medical inherited traits, including, for example, questions about paternity, which may not yet have been known. On another hand, parents uh, might be in a position to make better um, plans for their, their, their future child with respect to his, and her health, his or her health, and indeed with respect to their future needs. And yet others have argued that the same sort of information might mean that parents experience increased anxiety about a child's either current or future ill health, and therefore might end up treating a future child as if she or he were already ill. Information on the medical record, once it was actually in existence, could sit there, however, and be of future benefit. It could be accessed easily um, with respect to both the individual's future health but also with respect to the wider public interest. You might say that it could actually contribute to research, for example, obviously in an anonymized fashion. But equally, the generation of information about individuals always can, leads to concerns and consternation about potential discrimination and potential stigmatization, particularly if individuals are disabled. So some of the key considerations, some of the themes that are going to be picked up by both of our teams tonight are, what's the relative importance of autonomy and privacy in this debate, when these values might actually pull in opposite directions. Given, as I mentioned earlier on, that the testing is likely to be offered privately and commercially, on what basis could the law or a state actually intervene in a justified fashion? From the point of view of the future person, the, the, the fetus is tested now but will become a future person there's for somebody with legal rights, there are fundamental questions about the interest and in the rights of, that, of those future persons and the question of whether or not they have a right not to know. And against that are arguments about the parent's right to know, fundamental tensions there. But at the bottom of this, if this information is going to be generated at all, and we don't think there's, that it's appropriate that it should continue to be stored, are we really willing to sanction the destruction of potentially valued information? Because that is a clear consequence of arguing against this type of information. <coughs> So those are some, some of the themes. What we're going to do is, at the moment, you'll see on your um, <coughs> chairs two pieces of paper. And we're going to have two votes tonight. We're going to have a vote now in light of what you think uh, with, with respect to the, the, to, to the proposition. I'll remind you of it in just a second. And um, we'll collect that now. And then after the, 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 uh, the debate from both sides, we'll have a final vote. And we're going to talk about all that up at the end and work out whether or not people have changed their views uh, and then we can discuss the reasons for that over a nice glass of wine. The format tonight is we're going to begin with Edinburgh. Edinburgh are arguing uh, for the motion that parents should have a uh, right to have access to this. You're going to hear in sequence from Shannon, who is Edinburgh's uh, team leader, then Belen and then Nathan, five minutes each on that proposition. So then we will hear Glasgow's rebuttal from Caitlin and Hannah, five minutes each. We'll then swap the positions and we'll hear from Glasgow's um, Rejection of the motion tonight, led by Francesca, who is their team captain, followed by Laura and Anna, five minutes each, and then Edinburgh's rebuttal from uh, Davina and Joe, with five minutes, and ultimately, team captains will have ten minutes each to try and persuade you, in light of what you've heard, that you should vote for them, and we'll have the final vote. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to pass over to the teams, and I'm going to invite Edinburgh to kick off. My name is Shannon and I'm a third year law student. This sentence is arguing for the proposition that parents should be able to have the right to choose whether to obtain the whole genome of their future child through non-invasive fetal testing and that they should be able to retain this information. 
I will be arguing that it is in the best interest of the child, since parents will be able to access key health information that can be used to treat their child more effectively or to provide a basis for um, future planning. My colleague Belen will be discussing parental rights and autonomy, and my colleague Nathan will be discussing the privacy rights for the future child. Before I begin, I would just like to reiterate that this testing is non-invasive, meaning that there is no harm to the mother or to the child, meaning that there is no risk of miscarriage. Secondly, testing is for the whole genome, meaning that parents will be able to obtain both health and non-health related information. I would also like to emphasise that in arguing for the health benefits of whole genome sequencing, we are not making any judgments as to the value or quality of life of those suffering from medical conditions compared to those who are not. My argument is that parents should have the choice to pursue the, uh, these health benefits if they choose to. So to begin. At present, current prenatal testing provides information about specific medical conditions. Whole genome sequencing would provide a much vaster scope of information. Uh, this would be about a child's current genetic disorders as well as potential future diseases. Since it is impossible to predict which specific disorders a child may suffer from, or either at present or in the future, having the opportunity to test for genetic disorders gives parents the option of obtaining important information about their child's health. This can benefit the child in a number of ways. Firstly, it is possible to detect current genetic mutations, which means that parents can choose to pursue um, more effective, targeted in utero treatment to ensure that the child is born in the best possible health. Whole genome sequencing can now be performed as early as the first trimester of the pregnancy, meaning it is possible to detect problems early and to take action to protect the child. Treatment can be instigated before symptoms appear. In other words, parents can use this information as they see fit to make decisions about their, um, their unborn child. I am sure you will, like me, agree that, a parent, uh, sorry, that as a parent, one should be able to have the right to make an informed decision about pursuing such treatment. Secondly, it is also possible for parents to detect the propensity of their child developing a particular disorder in the future. Parents can then choose to adapt their lifestyles if they wish to by taking precautionary steps that can help to minimize the risk of disease in the future. This is an opportunity that they would never have had if not for being able to pursue whole genome sequencing. And this could prevent potential suffering of their future child as an adult. Even if there is a risk that the child may develop um, an untreatable adult onset condition, obtaining the information from childhood allows parents and the future child as he or she grows older to prepare for such conditions and to plan appropriate care. This surely is preferable to a sudden onset where no care plan or financial plan has been put in place. Therefore, pursuing whole genome sequencing can allow parents to, to use their time to prepare and to minimize potential suffering and discomfort. Why should a parent be denied this choice? Prenatal whole genome sequencing can help firstly to prevent genetic conditions developing in utero and can also offer information about genetic risks that provides an opportunity to inform possibilities for a good life. In simple terms, whole genome sequencing allows parents to choose to take action to prevent the development of genetic disorders as they see fit. It can, help, uh, it can allow parents to choose to make lifestyle changes that can help prevent the onset of future disorders. And it can help parents and the future child make important decisions about the child's health. The fact that whole genome sequencing also produces non-medical information about the child is therefore immaterial on this basis. It is a necessary byproduct of our practice that can help parents to act in an informed manner as they see fit for the health of the child. The potential advantages of the procedure outweigh the fact that they also find out about intelligence or athleticism. I'm sure my Glasgow colleagues will argue that this opens up the possibility of parents making decisions based on non-medical information. However, this is a debate about freedom and autonomy on matters of health, which I argue trumps these issues. So I'd just like to leave you with one thought. Is it not surely preferable to give parents the choice to seek treatment that could help prevent their child from developing a specific disorder rather than prohibiting whole genome sequencing simply because non-medical data is also obtained, which is a theoretical philosophical claim. My name is Delane and I'm a standard at in Medical Law and Ethics. Should prospective parents be able to acquire whatever genetic information they want about their features? Our answer is yes. 
they have the right to acquire it and use it as they see fit. And why is this? It's because of the respect of autonomy, <coughs> the principle of the primacy of the individual. The concept of autonomy invokes the integrity of the person and the dignity of the human body. The right of the individual to decide what is to be done with his or her body and the right to make decisions over treatment. This is the right to self-determination. Because this test will be done prior to birth, the fetus is within the womb and therefore is part of the woman. So the woman is the one who has the right to know about the information of these fetus. Women, women may choose when, with whom, and how to reproduce. And they have the right to get, they have the right to data that may inform these decisions. She is the only one who can decide whether a test should be done on her body, whether to get the information of that test, and then be able to, pro, to make an informed and autonomous decision. For example, whether to continue the pregnancy or not. Even though this is not a debate of ending a pregnancy or not, we acknowledge that our colleagues might raise this as a counter-argument. However, we would like to remind ourselves that the United Kingdom legislation under certain conditions allow the pregnant woman to end the pregnancy. This confirms the autonomy and self-determination of a pregnant woman to decide over her own body and to get information of that test. This means that future parents have the right to know the information about the whole genome sequencing prior to birth. We have established uh, this right to know, and we suggest that the whole genome sequence be presented as a, an additional choice. It's extremely important to be given a choice. The ethical foundation for providing this option is a basic right of, the, of reproductive choice and parental autonomy. We know that some parents would probably opt not to obtain this information, which is fine. But we also know that some other parents, on the contrary, would prefer to be prepared for the future of the child. So we consider that there is no reason why we should interfere this right to get enough information to make an informed and autonomous choice. The rationale behind the current genetic test is based on providing direct medical benefit to the child. Therefore, this autonomous choice refers to the right to receive information that involves the health and the well-being of the child. So why should we interfere with this right to get information? It is going to be for the well-being of the child. This right to know includes also the information about future and possible risks. This can reasonably inform reproductive decisions and help parents prepare for a child's future may motivate families to adopt lifestyle modifications that they might otherwise not have made a priority. These uh, parents may be better able to adapt psychologically to bringing up a child with a certain genetic conditions. And parents may also be better able to make social and financial arrangements for care of their child in advance. Instead of creating concerns about the right to know, which we think is clear who has the right to know the information, concerns about misunderstanding should encourage the development of educational resources to improve, to improve the comprehension of the complexity of this genetic information. It is a necessary framework that acknowledges the right of parents to make autonomous choice. In sum, we consider that the future parents have the right to know about the whole genome sequencing information prior to birth. Pregnant woman is the one who has the right to decide which study is going to be, on, it's going to be done on her body and what to do with this information. Some other questions may arise after this. For example, how to understand this information that we obtain of the test? How to retain this information? These questions will be addressed by my colleague Megan. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the House, my name is Nathan. Uh, I'm a first year law student at the University of Edinburgh. And my argument concerns the retention of the data produced in the test and the, the use of the data throughout the life of a child. In our minds, the argument does not concern the right to know and retain the genetic information of an unborn child, but indeed alludes to the choice to hold and use this information. Our learned Glasgow colleague would appear to believe that all information would be shared if 
that rational considerations of the feelings of the family involved and the testing will somehow become mandatory if allowed to proceed. What I would like to address is that these assumptions, no matter how convincing or well founded, will not materialise into real or indeed perceivable issues. The genetic information given by the testing would only be accessible through a qualified healthcare professional, in particular one with a close family relationship with the family concerned, say their local general practitioner. The GP would act as the mediator of negotiations and would be responsible for ensuring correct privacy and confidentiality standards are maintained. They, in effect, would be the guardian of that information, holding accountability over the use of the data. They would also provide genetic counselling to individuals involved. All access would be negotiated and monitored by the healthcare professional. Another key point to take from this argument is that the family would re would realistically understand the test results provided. Again, this would be done through the GP who would explain everything and the risks involved with the use of the data. They would go through all of the options available and ensure a clear understanding of the situation by the parties involved in order for them to make informed decisions. Healthcare professionals already hold a lot of personal information about us, so is it really too far that they would know more? future implications for our health care as well, so that they could make appropriate provision in order to prevent it. However, this House must firmly believe that the child is the most important party in this process. We must emphasise the fact that this is a choice to be offered, and we are not in any way suggesting that females should be made to participate in the testing. Doing so would compromise a parent's autonomy, which is another of our key concerns. All choice would remain with the child's mother, the one with the rights over her own body, and it must be made clear that control would remain with the families, despite what our learned Glasgow colleagues would suggest. From all of this, it is clear that the privacy would not be an issue if it were allowed to be go ahead, due to the tightly controlled regime which would certainly follow the testing's commencement. Both families and parents would closely together work, as they have always done. GPs already know a lot of personal information, so it must be fair to assume that they could also cope with this additional information. The treat our remedies, could they potentially prevent new ones from arising? This moves us on to our second point, which relates to the use of the genetic information produced from the testing. Well, we realise that tests would provide the whole genome and that this motion also refers to this. Trivial matters such as eye colour, intelligence, body type, and all other trivial matters are unlikely to affect parents' decisions, despite what others may believe. Anyway, it is estimated that predictions using the genome for these types of features are only 50% accurate, and so they must clearly not hold too much precedence over family decisions. All families would be informed of the decisions which they are going to make and would work closely with the help of their GP. The Article 8 of the European Convention of Human Rights, a right to respect for family, private and family life, is of huge significance here, and the families have the right to contact and say in their personal family matters. Once again, we refer to the word right, but it is indeed a choice which families must make. As we have seen, it is clear that the benefits of really revealing the genetic information of an unborn child could be great, and that privacy and confidentiality would clearly not be an issue contrary to what our learned friends would believe. The use of genetic information could be life-saving, and isn't that worth thinking about? After all, we are all humans and have the right to life. When it is all said and done, the use of genetic testing is a choice which families must make. What is worse, to reveal a little, some, a little something about a person, or risk them succumbing to unforeseen circumstances? So really, is it better to know? Thank you.
probabilistic information about the DNA sequencing of close genetic relatives. Furthermore, the data obtained from the whole genome sequence can also reveal very useful information which can help to predict future and present health risks, not only to the individual tested, but also to the relatives of that individual. This raises serious and important questions about what obligations, if any, are owed to the family members of the fetus undergoing genetic testing. This could pose a major ethical dilemma for doctors. The parents may refuse to share the information on the diagnosis that is made for a serious genetic disorder or a condition that is highly preventable and where there is a high risk of relatives carrying the same disease mutation. Under such circumstances, a medical practitioner may suspect that the relatives would rather be made aware of the test results and hence the medical practitioner could face a serious conflict of interest in respect to patient-doctor confidentiality. Furthermore, we have heard from our uh, and our colleagues that genome sequencing would help prevent a, a genetic condition. How exactly can <coughs> sorry, testing for the genome sequence prevent a genetic condition? You cannot prevent a genetic condition found in an unborn fetus. Your only option would be to terminate the pregnancy. However, we have also heard from Edinburgh that genome sequencing could help you with the future planning. Would this be future planning in terms of genetic mutation? So, <clears throat> genome sequencing could lead to genetic modification and may um, result in distorted definitions of the word normal. <coughs> the ability to code for all gene mutations of an individual could easily lead to the development of what is an ideal human by discriminating against certain traits and eliminating or even altering them. Isn't this like many of the creatures, such as Hitler's idea of the human race? What genes exactly are defined as normal and what are these mutations? If the muta for example, if the mutations and sequence responsible for autism are discovered by scientists, will this mean that scientists will then spend money um, trying to find a treatment to eliminate autism. Um, previously in history, we have seen geniuses such as Einstein and Mozart, who is, who is widely speculated, um, carried autism. Would this mean that we would lose this sort of genius? Um, I'd like to pass over to my colleague Hannah, who will um, further complete. Good afternoon, and thank you, Edinburgh, for the interview invitation today. Uh, my name is Hannah Gower and I'm a fifth and final year medical student. Edinburgh raised some fine points but unsurprisingly we disagree and on two points in particular. One, information is not always a blessing and secondly understanding information can be hugely challenging even for a specialist. So in regards to my first point I'd like to just briefly state that actually what you could be potentially doing is reducing the adult autonomy of the future child. You are taking away the ability for them to choose whether or not they want to have knowledge about a condition. For instance, something like Huntington's, which is what I'll mention again, is an, inc an incredibly debilitating and often an eventually <coughs> fatal disease that very commonly is used as an example of some people choosing not to be tested because they do not want to know whether or not they have this condition and some people who do. Now, if a parent chooses to want to know this from a whole genome sequencing, then you've taken away that choice from the future adult that they are wishing to raise. In addition, genes aren't always definitive prognostically. Okay, Huntington's is one that we can test for, we can say if you have the gene, then I'm sorry, you will develop Huntington's. But there's new evidence to show something like schizophrenia, which is very un not very greatly understood. There are some genes that inc increase your risk for it, but again, we don't know how these genes interact with the environment. And to tell someone, well, you have this gene for schizophrenia, but we're not really sure it's 100% for schizophrenia, we don't really know how it interacts, but we'd like you just to be aware of this knowledge and all the anxiety that goes with something. And this is, you can see this out with the genetics into breast cancer. So, for instance, you can take a biopsy from someone who presents with a lump and say, well, it's not, it's not cancer yet, and we don't know if it will become cancer, but there's a certain minimal chance that it could become cancer. Now, these women, and I have personal experience in this, may choose to have a radical mastectomy and remove both breasts. Now, that's a major operation for any woman, and any operation comes with risks. 
No, we can't say definitively because our understanding of this research is still very restricted. And therefore, we can't tell these women, actually, you probably never needed to have both your breasts removed because that lump was probably never going to become malignant. And you actually have no risk factors and no definitive. So again, our information about genes, our information about other conditions is still very restricted in terms of prognostics. In addition, we had this kind of appeal, a well, kind of information from the Edinburgh team about, well, we have inter-utero management if we were able to detect these conditions. Well, that could be possible in the future, but again, think about the size of it. I mean, a neonate, a brand new child, the heart is the size of a walnut. And to be able to perform congenital heart surgery on these children is such a significant surgery, hence the huge degree of specialisation in it. And in addition, even if it wasn't that there was a significant risk, there may not even be any management at all. If you're telling these parents, you have a condition for this child, but we can't afford give any management, are you ready to take on that role as gen for genetic counselling? And to follow on to my second other point, we had this important about bodily autonomy and the right to information. And I agree, these are hugely important concepts within medicine. But to be able to, be able to adequately consent these patients, because what you're saying to these people is that, okay, you have this sequence of information essentially, but we don't understand it all. And I, I don't understand all the conditions in it if I was a specialist doctor counseling these future patients. And, okay, yes, there's some conditions, a very few number of conditions we can tell you definitively, but how can I translate this huge scope of specific knowledge into non-jargon, layman's language that they people feel adequately comfortable in understanding to truly be able to take on an informed decision, to be able to truly consent? And also there's the point about inequity. Parental's education level will likely affect the choice or the uptake of this service, but it will also affect the impact that this information will have on families. Now, whether or not one way or the other, I think inequity of understanding is an important point to raise and to be considered. So in summary, whole genome sequencing generates a huge amount of data that in the current research level lacks meaning, and data without meaning, as we all know, is wasteful and potentially damaging. My name is Francesca, I'm a Faculty Law student at the University of Glasgow. Ladies and gentlemen, today we have heard from the University of Edinburgh a number of points why parents have an absolute right to know the whole genome and retain this information of their future children through non invasive fetal testing. However, representing the opposition, the University of Glasgow will submit on the contrary that this is not desirable for three main reasons. Firstly, I will submit that the right is not in the interests of either the parents or the child in terms of the parents being able to fulfil and discharge their parental rights and responsibilities. Secondly, my colleague Laura will go on to discuss that the right would represent an excessive burden on the NHS and that which simply does not have the resources to provide the associated service. Finally, Anne will go on to discuss that there will be several pragmatic difficulties in granting the rights in relation to privacy and data storage. Moving on to the substance of my submission. By virtue of Scots law, parental rights and responsibilities are inextricably linked. In other words, parents only have rights in relation to the children to the extent that they enable them to discharge their parental responsibilities. In Scotland, a parent has a duty to safeguard and promote their health of their child, for instance. Now, we believe the inherent problem in this debate is that, firstly, genome testing is not 100% determinative for future illnesses and health conditions, and secondly, that it has the potential to reveal findings of unknown clinic utility and non-medical inherited traits. Now, the reason why we see this as a problem is because it's difficult to understand how this information better enables parents to safeguard and promote the health of their child. And on this basis, it follows that if the right does not aid fulfillment of responsibility, <coughs> it should not be allowed. In her rebuttal, Hannah pointed to the fact that even if we are able to identify conditions that the child may go on to develop or are definite, there may not necessarily be treatment. So like, really, what does that right actually fulfill? Now, Edinburgh has submitted that parents should be able to exercise their autonomy in making a decision about the health and well-being of their child. However, it is our submission that it is reasonable to assume that parents will not have the medical knowledge to understand the practical implications of genome sequencing in terms of determining future illnesses and health 
health conditions. It's not only a problem of understanding the significance of positive findings. Many individuals will perhaps assume incorrectly that a negative finding means that they have no risk of disorder, instead of understanding that it simply means that they only have an only in the population risk. Genetics is a highly complex area of medicine and which requires professionals with special training to interpret the consequences of individual genome sequences. Edinburgh suggested that GPs would be able to take this and guide patients through this information, but we just simply don't believe that's the case. This is a really specialist area of medicine, one that your general practitioner is just not likely to have. Now, to suggest, as Edinburgh could have, has hinted at, that if parents have the right to retain this information, it's simply to um, facilitate their understanding. That's just simply naive. I mean, at the very least, we would submit that um, there would be, have to be a significant increase of genetic counsellors available to guide parents through the medical implications, and possibly even educational initiatives to better inform parents. And these would need to be developed, not without cost, as Laura will go on to discuss further. Now finally, even if one were to concede that this right is necessary to discharge parental responsibilities and somehow parents are able to understand and interpret the practical implications of this right, we believe that it's neither desirable for the parent or the child to know this information. It's our submission that if parents have the absolute right to the whole genome of their future child, this is going to result in heightened anxiety during pregnancy, which is neither beneficial for parents or child. Furthermore, once a child is born, this is likely to leave parents being overprotected of the child and treating the child as, as if he or she already has that illness. Yet, as the child, as has been mentioned, the child may never go on to develop this illness um, because the sequencing is not 100% determinative. Now, furthermore, we believe there's a potential for the child to be discriminated against on the basis of their medical record, which Professor Laurie has already indicated could be accessed easily either in the interest of their own health or that of the wider public. Now, given that fetal testing is already available for families with a history of certain health conditions such as Huntington's, we, for, um, we fail to understand how granting an absolute right to all parents would um, be of further benefit given that those at risk already have access to genetic testing. In our opinion, the advantages simply do not weigh out the disadvantages and thus for all reasons submitted we earn the audience for the solution. <laughs> My name is Laura Rankin and I am a third year law student at the University of Glasgow. In my submission, I will outline the difficulties implementing the proposed motion with having the National Health Service. Undeniably, the continued growth in healthcare spending in the UK, seen over the last few decades, is unsustainable in the long term. Rapid advances in both genomic knowledge and technologies, coupled with a difficult financial climate, is leading to increased demands <coughs> in the NHS, with already limited resources in which to meet existing demands. Whilst I acknowledge that the cost of mapping the genome has significantly decreased, if sequencing technologies are to be translated into clinical use in the NHS, the provision of informatics and IT within the health system will need an overhaul in order to provide appropriate support for the whole genome sequencing. The National Genetics Reference Laboratory in Manchester currently develops and maintains the resources that NHS Diagnostic Genetic Services require in order to operate and develop effectively. However, the majority of bioinformatics expertise and storage capacity for biomedical data in the UK currently lies outside of the NHS, in research centres such as the European Bioinformatics Institute. They include access to high-performance computer clusters and dedicated storage facilities with enormous capacity. There is no guarantee that these will be trans translated for clinical use within the NHS, and if it is, it will come at a huge cost. Furthermore, the size of stored data files also has major implications for data transfer. Sequence data may need to be transferred from the sequence machine and moved to several other locations for further analysis and safekeeping. It is likely a huge capacity for transferring terabytes of data will be required, which is substantially beyond the ability of the NHS network. Systems in place are not designed to track individuals. Management pathways would have to be established to enable this to happen if parents wish to access their child's personal genome. Moreover, the NHS Connecting for Health programme manages the National Programme for IT, 
to facilitate the sharing of individual electronic records between the provision of primary and secondary care to implement patient care across geographic and institutional boundaries. As a result of financial constraints, there has been a delay in the implementation of the programme across the UK. More, more research is required into the potential impact of whole ge genome sequence data on the electronic patient systems and records. Furthermore, if the Health Health Service are able to reduce the funds, it may be an unprecedented amount of time before the appropriate system is in place. Additionally, informed consent will be extremely challenging because of the extraordinary range of possible findings and potential significance. Healthcare providers will not have the time to participate in a detailed informed consent process. This is in increasing relevance, as my Edinburgh counterparts, I'm sure, will acknowledge, as a result of the judgment handed down by the Supreme Court in the case of Montgomery against Lanarkshire Health Board in 2015, enshrining the doctrine of conform informed consent into Scots law. Furthermore, after healthcare providers receive the results, they will need to translate the whole genome sequence data into an individual plan for prevention, surveillance and treatment. Do healthcare professionals really have the experience and time to develop such plans and explain them to patients? Ormond established that an individual person will have about 100 genetic risks that will need to be discussed. If each of these risks were to be covered in three minutes, it would take five hours to explain. This is time that would have to be detracted from other areas. Primary care physicians and general practitioners, as it has already been suggested, generally do not have to have significant training or experience in traditional cl cl clinical genetics, let alone the arcane world or molecular genetics and genomics. Are, do the health, health service really have the uh, funds to offer additional educational to, to those who require it? As my learning colleague has already suggested, the lay population's understanding of genetics is extremely limited. New educational initiatives and self-learning programmes geared to various knowledge levels will need to be developed in multiple languages for diverse media and electronic platforms. Again, this will mean further spending to make this possible. Existing <coughs> NHS labs may also be involved in the retesting of samples to validate results obtained in a research setting to clinical standards, which might impact upon the capacity of labs to deal with their current workloads. Another problem is individuals who have already made use of privately available sequencing will seek help from the NHS to interpret results or further investigate possible further health problems. Emerging research suggests that 25 to 78% of participants might seek further guidance in the results from clinicians, providing this support could divert, divert health service resources. Ergo, the financial problems which will manifest themselves if the proposed motion is to put into place to block devastating effects for the NHS. I'm Anna Nelson and I'm a third year law student. I will be continuing the opposition of this motion on behalf of Glasgow. And in my submission, I will deal with the consent issues surrounding full genome sequencing, the right to and not to access information, and the negative uses to which the information is likely to be put. Our Edinburgh colleagues suggest that we apply the simple mother has all rights theory to the issue of giving consent to a full genome sequence. But we submit this is an overly simplistic view of a complicated issue which has much far-reaching impact on a child. So we submit that instead a consideration of what is in the medical best interest of the child must occur, with the advantages and disadvantages of the procedure weighed against each other. Prenatal sequencing will not always be in the best interest of a child. Having to grow up with the knowledge of a late onset disease may have an incredibly detrimental effect on a person's mental health. In the US, statistics show that those who have had a positive result in a genetic test for Huntington's, a late onset disease that we have discussed earlier, have a suicide rate 10 times higher than the national average. Thus, prenatal sequencing cannot be an absolute right, as it cannot always be deemed to be in a child's best interests. It ought to only occur in certain situations in which it is clear that a specific factual benefit which outweighs the risk of psychiatric harm exists. In cases like this, we already have provisions for in the testing that we have just now. The second issue I will go on to concerns the access to the sequence genome. The motion here proposes that parents have the right to know and retain the genome. But once a child reaches the age of capacity, they become the person with the right to their medical records and their medical knowledge, and they are able to block a parent from finding out about this. Obviously, in the first few years of a child's life, the parent will need to know and has the right to access these records only to discharge their responsibilities towards that child. However, the parents with access to the full genome map 
will have information that will include diseases that will not manifest until that, that child is an adult, a time when that child should have control of what is known about them. Therefore, it is difficult to reconcile these two issues. Surely the knowledge held by parents about diseases which will affect the child in adulthood lessens the child's right to private and confidential medical records. This is especially true when a parent discusses the issue with her friends or family. More people know about that child's adult conditions than maybe the child would wish to, wish to happen. The parent is also likely to raise a child in a way where the child is aware of the disease. This removes the right of a child to, remove, to choose which information they wish to access about themselves as an adult, thus removing their autonomy at a time where we see the legal and medical profession making a move towards increasing and enhancing autonomy. In addition, there are a number of international <coughs> instruments which emphasise the right of a person not to know the results of the protest, <coughs> including the UNESCO Declaration on the Human Genome and Human Rights. It's hard to see how these, this right could be sufficiently respected in cases of prenatal genome sequencing. It would be impossible to enforce a rule banning parents from sharing information about late onset diseases with their child. The third issue I will discuss is use of the genome uh, with the medical context. Although it's not limited to this context, I'll discuss insurance as I feel like this is illustrative of a lot of the issues. Although there's only direct relevance in the case of health and life insurance, it expands further. Mortgages often require a person to have life insurance, as does travel insurance. The main issue which arises is that the information in the sequence is likely to be used in a discriminatory manner. It is well established that it's a fundamental right to equality. We find that in Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we find it in Article 18 of the ECHR. A contract of insurance is one of utmost good faith. That means you are required to disclose the information you know in order for your insurance to be valid. If everyone has access to the genome, it would be easy for insurers to simply ask questions, allowing them to select groups of people with a predisposition to specific diseases who they refuse to insure or who they will insure at a much higher price. Thus, instances of discrimination become prevalent, which is not allowed at national, international, or European law. Furthermore, there are questions of whether a person who has had their genome sequenced, who has somehow managed to escape finding out about the information that they have chosen not to know, could be forced to do so in order to answer valid questions, as insurance contracts require us to give information that we are reasonably able to obtain, which would be the case. I would just like to emphasise that my submission has focused on the consent, access to, and use of information, all of which we believe would be an issue. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mubila, and I am in my first year of medicine at the University of Edinburgh. So, Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen, now, this area of medicine is highly complex and is always evolving. Since the countless developments in genetic technology that have happened in recent years, this is really a real possibility that we could soon sequence the whole genomes of fetuses. And we have to ask ourselves, are we happy to stop this development as Glasgow are asking us to do and condemn millions of future parents to the anxiety and uncertainty of not knowing whether their child has a disease or not? Now, my counter to Glasgow will focus on two of the main points. Firstly, this issue of the practicalities of the proposal. And secondly, um, this idea of the burden on the NHS that the proposal will bring. Both of which have been also rebutted by my colleagues and both of which I will address now. Now, Glasgow talked a lot about what are the actual practical purposes of our proposal. And I would say the foremost purposes, the health benefits that it will bring. We have this example of breast cancer and say this is information that we give to parents but actually is useless and will only add anxiety to them. But we have examples in the media, such as that of the actress Angelina Jolie, where a genetic counsellor told her she had an 85% risk of developing breast cancer because of the gene she had. And she used this information to get preventative mastectomy, which now, she says, was her choice. She emphasised, as our team did, that she had the choice to make this based on the information that she was given. And we would like to expand this principle to any parent that wishes to do this for their own child, because we see this as a basic right to know. Furthermore, um, as well as a psychological benefit, we see a practical benefit of this information. Parents can um, make 
Parents can make preparations for the child's education and care facilities once they were born. And into the future, they can make financial arrangements for any further care their child will need. And we also bring up the medical benefits. Why does it needs to be done specifically in pregnancy? First, we bring up the example of <coughs> congenital diseases such as congenital haemophilia, which in certain cases needs to be treated the minute the child is born. So by giving this prophylactic treatment from birth, it prevents them developing the actual disease later in life, which we see as a real benefit that only our proposal brings. As well as this, certain conditions have to be treated in utero, such as recent incompatibility between mother and child. That can be diagnosed in utero, thanks to our proposal, and can be diagnosed in utero through blood transfusions or other things. We also have the point of parental responsibility, saying that it's irresponsible to learn this clinically irrelevant data such as paternal rights or eye colour. But as Shannon already mentioned, this is an unfortunate byproduct of a really important process which is learning the genetic um, genetic information related to diseases. So we admit this is a point. But we also say that genetic counselling is critical to our proposal in helping people understand what the information <coughs> actually means. And to this point of the burden on the NHS, we recognise that it would take extra funds. But we have seen in recent years the government has recently invested a billion pounds in whole genome sequencing. They plan to sequence a hundred people's genomes by the end of 2017. So we see that there, this is being prioritised and we think this burden is not as exaggerated as Glasgow would have you believe. And actually, it's a basic principle of medical research that with more innovation as we are seeing, you get more cost reduction. For example, now the government's advisor on genetics says that the NHS could, in a few years, be able to carry out genome sequencing for less than £100 a person. We think our proposals will not only decrease parents' anxiety because they know what, rather than being totally uncertain. We think it's quicker than screening methods nowadays, and we also think that it's more accurate as supported by many studies that have been done. Now, Glasgow's insisted on focusing on cost-benefit analysis and practicalities, but this is a debate about practicality. This is about are we really prepared as a society? to be able to sequence people's genome before they're even born. Now, Glasgow talked a lot about the pound value and costing, but we think, what is the value of parents' autonomy? What is the value of people's rights to their own child? What is the value Time. of peace of mind? privacy raised by Glasgow and also like to take time to address specifically the issue of privacy itself. Thereafter, the right of the child not to know their genetic information and finally the issue of genetic discrimination. So first in regards to privacy of the child, it is clear beyond reasonable doubt in law and medicine that an unborn child, a fetus, is not recognised as a legal person. Therefore, no rights can be said to attach to a fetus. To the best of my knowledge, no legal precedent exists to suggest that the current or future privacy of an unborn child who is subject to the protection of the law. Case law from the European Court of Human Rights would indicate the latter statement is correct. In the recent case of Vaux against France, in 2004, the European Court of Human Rights made it explicitly clear that a fetus is not directly protected under the European Convention on Human Rights. Thus, no reasonable case can be made that parents should not have access to this information on the basis that it would interfere with the future privacy rights of the unborn child, as no such rights of privacy yet exist. What's more, whole genome sequencing in the prenatal context does not present an exceptional interference with the privacy of the child. Infants prior and after birth are subject to various medical tests that could present a risk to the right to respect of privacy. A recent example of the collection and storage of gutter cards in Scotland since 1965 this collection contains more than 2.5 million cards, including blood, DNA sampling, and highly personal information that's open to research purposes. If such large amounts of highly personal information can be stored in this manner, then I suggest it's inconsistent to disallow parents access genetic information regarding their own child, 
species as information will be used to benefit the welfare of the child. Second, regarding the right not to know of the child. Providing parents with access to this data on the basis that the future child has a right not to know this information is unconvincing at best. The right not to know has come under much debate as the depth of predictive genetic knowledge has grown, and thus is perhaps an unstable concept. It's important not to place too much weight on the right not to know. The potential health benefits of abandoning a strong right not to know greatly outweighs the common use of harms. Indeed, the principle of beneficence in medicine must be weighed against the right not to know, and the potential benefits of genome sequencing and the advance in this area of technology may allow the inference to be drawn that beneficence in this context may reasonably outweigh the right not to know. Indeed, the right not to know is often disregarded in current practice when it serves the best interests of the patient. Furthermore, there are many examples of non-genetic information possessing comparable predictive power, which is often disclosed without any explicit permission. For example, a test revealing high blood pressure can indicate one's chance of developing heart disease. Genetic information is therefore not in some way ontologically different from other medical information. Given the thorough rejection of genetic exceptionalism, why should we give the right not to know in the context of genetics such significant concern? What's more, it's thoroughly impossible for parents to know their future child's preference this information. Thus, we should leave the choice and discretion wholly with the parent, assuming they will act in the best interest of that child. Even if the child won't expose this information, Studies show, as opposed to what Glasgow suggests, that psychological harm is actually thoroughly overstated and instead very transient and mild, and few experience regret of receiving such information. Lastly, I'd like to address the fear of genetic discrimination. Fears of genetic discrimination <coughs> are also thoroughly over-exaggerated. Genetic information, as already emphasised, is not exceptional. Other medical information can reveal the, can reveal the nature of our genotypes. For example, a very high cholesterol is strong evidence a person carries two alleles for familial hypocholesterolemia. If almost all medical information can draw inferences about our genotypes, then why treat and protect genetic information separately from other medical data? Furthermore, the UK National Health Service ensures that discrimination in healthcare is of little relevance or importance to this discussion. This has only been a real concern in the United States. And it shows the United States is also moving toward the system of public health there, thus the concern is slight. There is also little good evidence available to suggest that genetic discrimination exists in employment or insurance. Even if genetic discrimination was a real concern, there have already been suggestions in the UK to enact legislation similar to that in the United States to prohibit discrimination from genetic information in employment and insurance. The legislation in the United States has already shown this is relatively inexpensive and very easy to enforce. So in sum, I would just like to submit that an unborn child has no right to respect to privacy and thus should not inhibit the parents' access to information. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we have demonstrated to you that parents should have the option to obtain the whole genome of their child and that they should be able to retain this information. We see this as by no means compulsory, but rather serves as a means of giving parents more choice over decisions about their child's health and allows them to choose to be more informed. For this reason, Glasgow's argument that it demonstrates a preference for particular traits cannot hold up, because how can we say that if it is not compulsory? If we have no compulsory procedure whereby people have to be tested for certain diseases um, in order to, um, to mitigate them, then we cannot say this. We have demonstrated that whole genome sequencing gives parents the choice to make informed decisions. This allows to, make, um, to pursue more effective treatment. Glasgow's argument that termination <coughs> is the only option is not necessarily the case, and later they did concede that a neutral treatment is possible. We see this as being an option that parents can pursue. Secondly, when we discuss lifestyle planning, we see this as not, as indicated, planning for potential future genetic mutations, but making social and financial and care plans for the future which is something that is within the remit of the decision-making power of parents. And certainly, this should be the decision of the parents of the unborn child. Prior to being born alive, as my colleague Joe already indicated, a child is not a person in law, and therefore has virtually no rights. This is not a debate about when a person should be deemed to have any legal personality or identity. This is the current state of the law, and so we should proceed on this basis. 
There can therefore be no valid argument relating to the autonomy of the fetus, as she or he has not yet a legal existence, and so it is the autonomy of the parents that takes precedence. This is the process currently. Decisions about unborn ch uh, children, such as choosing to end treatment that could save the life of the child, is currently within the remit of the decision-making capacity of the mother. The mother is already the ultimate decision-maker regarding a fetus. The best interest test does not therefore apply to an unborn child. Why then should whole genome sequencing be any different? Why should the autonomy of the parents be unduly restricted? If a parent wants to obtain genetic information about their unborn child, should they not be able to do so when it is about important health-related information? Is it not preferable for parents to choose to be more informed about these risks? Moreover, whole genome sequencing offers parents the option of preparation. They can choose to make lifestyle changes and social changes as they see fit to benefit the child. We are not suggesting that this is any definite way of preventing the onset of future diseases, but it allows parents and children to plan for how they may, may deal with these as they come. It allows time for consideration. It allows for psychological preparation as well, should the child risk developing a disease in the future, both in terms of the parent and the future child as he or she gets older. The ability to prepare in this way will certainly be, more, uh, will certainly be appealing to a number of parents, it is inevitable that as parents, individuals may want to have the opportunity to seek treatment options for their child or to plan their health care. Denying the parents that option is an injustice. It denies them not only their autonomy, but also undermines their judgment as parents to make decisions in the best interest of their child. We all have a right under Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights for respect for private and family life. We live in a society where individuals have personal autonomy. Since the child is in the womb and therefore part of the, the woman, she should have the autonomy to make decisions about her own body and about the child's health. Any notion otherwise could only be justified in a society that lacks conceptions of autonomy and human rights. This is not the society we live in, and therefore any claim is completely unfounded. On that note, any arguments for the privacy of the unborn child are also invalid, <clears throat> since a fetus can hold no privacy rights. Whilst one may consider that continued access to the information has the potential to conflict with the future child's privacy rights as an adult, as Glasgow indicated. In law, that argument cannot make logical sense. The medical intervention that generated the information took place when the child was a fetus, with no rights, when, uh, sorry, and when there could be no consideration of privacy. So what would be a solution? Our Glasgow colleagues would argue allowing the retention of the data unnecessarily breaches the future child's privacy. So what then should be done with the data that's already been generated? Should it be destroyed? No, is our answer. Continued access to the information, as indicated earlier, is necessary to ensure that the parents, and when the time comes, the future child, understands the information and its implications throughout the course of life. Glasgow indicated that this was a naive consideration. However, I would argue that retention of the data is essential. I'd like to you to imagine if the parent chooses to tell the child about the information, say, 5, 10, 20 years' time, or even further into the future, is it not unreasonable to expect that they will remember the information and its implications? Is it not preferable that they will have continued access so that they are in a better position to explain it to their child? This is especially true since most parents will not be medical professionals. So there would be a risk that the information could be misunderstood in the future and in turn misunderstood by the child, which would have potential consequences. In any event, the breach of privacy of the future child can be mitigated by ensuring that it's only accessed by specific medical professionals who, as my colleague Nathan indicated, will have a close relationship with the family. This ties into the argument that future children, or as Glasgow mentioned, other family members, have a right not to know this data. However, we already have demonstrated that this argument lacks a solid foundation. The concept is too abstract to justify a prohibition of whole genome sequencing, since it is impossible to predict whether a future child will at any point want to know that information. Their right not to know conflicts with their potential right to know. Which should take precedence? It is an impossible determination. The potential benefits of whole genome sequencing outweighs this potential concern, which may never materialise in a number of cases. 
In any event, at the time of sequencing, the child, as I have already stated, has no rights. There can be no obligation to, get, to consider potential future rights of the child in this way, as it conflicts with the principle in law that an unborn child is not a legal person. The discretion must therefore be with the parents. It is to the parents to act in the interest of the child, and again, for the parents to decide whether to tell the child about this information. And indeed, this isn't a new idea. There are a number of examples of situations where it is left to the discretion of the parents to tell the child about information, personal information about the child. For example, parents have no legal obligation to inform their child as to whether or not they were conceived through, for example, the use of a donor. It is for parents to balance potential factors in making a decision regarding disclosure. There is no reasonable justification for departing from this principle in the case of whole genome sequencing. That's what also raised the point that there was the potential that um, because children may choose not to know this information, it could raise potential discrimination, for example, with insurance and the um, that duty of utmost good faith. Um, just a minor point, but that act is um, currently in the process of being changed and the duty of utmost good faith will not be um, the standard anymore. However, the general argument about discrimination, um, even putting that aside, would assume that people are discriminated against based on a, a disability or a disorder. And I think to, to presuppose that is a dangerous concept. Moving on. Whole genome sequencing is a procedure that is becoming more and more cost effective. In fact, it has been predicted that there may be a time in the not so distant future where it will be cheaper to sequence the entire genome compared to the current process of testing a specific section of one gene. Our Glasgow colleagues argue that information generated from the, uh, from the whole genome sequencing may not be entirely accurate or meaningful and is based on predictions rather than eventualities. However, with a process of genetic counselling, which we have said would be a compulsory part of the process, parents will be able to discuss this information and implications with a trained medical professional. The state of the information as an analysis of potential risk will be explained to the parents before they choose to obtain the whole genome of their child. They will be informed from the start that this information is by no means 100% conclusive. It is then for the parents to choose whether to proceed on this basis. So to summarise, whole genome sequencing gives parents the option to obtain a vast amount of information about their child that will enable them to make informed <coughs> choices as they see fit for the benefit of the child based on more accurate information um, that can be generated in a more cost-effective manner than the process we have currently. Certainly, to insinuate that because the information may not be completely accurate is an unfair standard because current testing cannot be 100% accurate. Supporting whole genome sequencing is to show support for parental autonomy and parental rights and to recognise that it allows parents to act in the interest of the well-being of their child. I therefore urge you to support this motion. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, today you have heard a comprehensive overview of the advantages and disadvantages which would be associated of whether parents should have the absolute right know and retain the whole genome of their unborn child through non-invasive fetal testing. It is our belief for the, on the opposition that these advantages simply do not outweigh the disadvantages. Now, Edinburgh has raised a couple of points which I'd like to address. Firstly, when they were putting forward the motion, they said that having the right to know this genome would allow for better information for the parents to enable them to plan for the future. Now, what's been raised by Glasgow, which we don't really feel like we've adequately addressed, is what if there is no treatment? This is only helpful so far as there is an existing treatment to date. And having this right in itself isn't going to generate that. Like, people might choose to have an abortion. We don't think it's like really a massive issue. But like people, it was acknowledged by Edinburgh, like, that's not the issue here. But it was raised as a point that people might choose to abort based on the genetic condition of their unborn child. And we think, like, really this isn't helpful when, you know, treatments might be developed in the future that could combat this condition. And it was also suggested in terms of, like, future planning that parental uh, parents might choose to alter their lifestyle to allow, um, in order to kind of protect against these conditions. But, like, I think that's pretty naive on the part of Edinburgh, just on the terms of like, 
not assuming that parents are bad parents, but you know, parents don't always necessarily do everything that's great for their children. I mean, in terms of like promoting a healthy diet, for instance. Um, now, secondly, looking at the retention of data, it was suggested that this could be held by the GP, but we think perhaps that this could be commodified and that really health shouldn't be a commodity in this respect. There are, you are generally required um, disclosed to insurers, as we've mentioned, any health information. And often employers ask for this information too, but not to discriminate, obviously. Um, but we feel that, sorry, coming up next. <laughs> um, yeah, and lastly, it was said at this point that the GP has the relevant information to be able to advise, which we simply just doesn't stand up to this debate was characterised by one of the Edinburgh speakers is the uncertainty of not knowing illness versus the uncertainty of the system. We believe that as we can already sequence human genomes, there is no uncertainty of not knowing this illness and that we already test for high risk conditions. Furthermore, the emphasis placed on genetic counselling that's quite generally for single conditions which have a family history of already. So the parents are already quite likely to have an understanding of that condition. And just simply that the resources don't exist, that we start scanning for a whole spectrum of illnesses that you know probably most health providers <coughs> don't have a great understanding of themselves, let alone like a lay individual. And um, and with race as well, that we don't have an issue with say things like the BRCA genes in terms of like your you've got a very high percentage of knowing whether or not you'll go on to develop breast cancer. But there's so much information on this already, like you have a really good chance of advising your patient that yes, you probably, you, know, you might want to have a mastectomy because there's such a high chance. Like, that's definitive, people already know that. But when we're talking about like really, only just emerging conditions that are really poorly understood, like how can we possibly say that? And um, in terms of like, it was suggested that we framed our arguments like on the debate in terms of practicalities and cost benefits versus autonomy. At the end of the day, the reason why we're here to discuss this is if it was going to come in, you have to think about the practicalities. All of this stuff needs to be financed. You know, this isn't some kind of philosophical debate. I and mean, these are very real consequences with a very real application. And it's just kind of like, oh, well, we're not going to really talk about this and we're not really going to acknowledge that. You know what, that's an issue because it's not even really being suggested, like how this would be implemented, for example, and there's still a lot of uncertainty whether it would be provided by the state uh, through the NHS or through like private um, uh, healthcare. And um, Glasgow, on the other hand, has submitted that parents they don't have the knowledge to understand this information and to use it to the advantage of their child. You know, in practice, we think it's really likely that it's just going to unnecessarily worry parents and cause them undue anxiety. And moreover, their child's likely to grow up kind of wrapped in cotton wool, so to speak, as the parents like endeavour to constantly, continually protect them for something that they may never even necessarily go on to suffer. I think most people here today in the audience would confirm that overprotective parents can be a bit of a bind at the best of times, but this is likely to go even further and have a significant impact upon their child's good. And furthermore, to provide parents with this absolute right is insufficient when there just simply aren't the resources to implement the associated services which would be required. And in Scotland, the NHS is simply unequipped to deal with the potential volume of whole genome sequencing because like as Edinburgh was already alluded to, most people might want to have this done. And, and like really just our healthcare system just doesn't, like it won't be able to cope with that. Um, genetic counselling, as we've already suggested, would greatly need to be expanded and really just better institutions and like better resources and better services put in place before we can even really consider doing this. And furthermore, it really needs to be questioned, like, is this actually an efficient use of our resources? Like, people who have high risk factors can already get tested, you know? It's just when, if all parents are suddenly granted this absolute right to request whole genome sequencing, instead of those who simply like an increased risk factor such as family health, you know, it's probably going to come back with nothing. Yet that's time and money that NHS like has to spend and then can't get back. You know, is that really beneficial? However, the shortage of resources is only really the beginning of the story. 
as there are serious issues about consent. Laura spoke earlier about informed consent and how it's extremely challenging to obtain parental consent given the extraordinary, uh, the extraordinary <coughs> range of possible findings. And the time restraints upon healthcare professionals participate and engage in a detailed informed consent process. Like, furthermore, like, as it's like, not being discussed here, really, the, the fact that like, obviously an unborn child, like, it doesn't matter that they're not um, a legal person, that they can't consent to testing, but it obviously has to be in, the best, in their best interest and with the advantages and disadvantages of the procedure weighed against each other. Now, we just simply don't feel that prenatal sequencing will always be in the best interest of the child is having to grow up with the knowledge of late onset disease may have a seriously de detrimental impact upon their well-being and health, as demonstrated that, like the US says statistics that we pointed to earlier, that if you're going to develop Huntington's, it's a 10% higher um, suicide rate than the national average. Like, this is clearly like a massive emotional burden to just dump on people. And they've not had like an inkling of the same. Because it's like always like, oh, is it better to know? And it's like, well, if you've got that hanging over you your entire life, like continually worrying about it, like, like yeah, of course you, you want to know at some point, but do you really need to know like potentially if you're going to develop, like say, let's say Alzheimer's in like your 60s or 70s? Like you could have 60 years of like living quite happily and then like then find out, you know, like we just don't feel like you need to be burdened up the entire the entirety of your life. And like the fact of the matter is that yes, some genes are strongly indicative of illnesses and health conditions that will be developed. But others, as the schizophrenia example that we mentioned earlier, you know, these partly to depend on environmental factors. And thus, like, a person in their family, they might have, say, pointed out to them, like, oh, we've got these, these genes, which might be, like, say, like, indicative of schizophrenia, but they might not actually ever go on to develop this. So in that case, you, their family and themselves will have to endure that anxiety for no apparent reason. And, like, we really don't feel like this mental anguish can be understated. Um, this links into human right considerations and the right not to know medical information, which is protected by several international instruments, as it's unclear how an absolute right to know and retain <coughs> the information is going to be compatible with either Article 8 or the UNESCO Declaration. Now, the right to know is in law the right to refuse non-emergency medical treatment, and in the case of heart disease, which Ed was pointed to as an example, Patients can already choose not to have the tests that would diagnose it. So like the fact that they kind of just undercut our argument there, just like they didn't really seem to properly acknowledge it. And um, we really just don't feel that parental sequencing can be an absolute right. It ought to only occur in certain factual situations in which it is clear that there is a specific benefit that outweighs the risk of psychiatric harm and distress, which is likely to only be in cases where there's a family history of disease, which may require early treatment or into which is other hard to describe. It's our submission that the status quo adequately secures the service and thus there is no need to introduce an absolute right. In conclusion, we respectfully submit that the Edinburgh, University of Edinburgh has failed to acknowledge the wider implications Hi. and therefore we urge you to oppose it. <laughs> Excellent. So we chose this topic because it is a very live issue and because the relative factors are actually very finely balanced. And I think that has been admirably demonstrated by both teams tonight. So can we just join together and thank both of them for a fantastic performance. <laughs> We've actually hosted this. The first year was in Edinburgh. Last year we came out to it to Glasgow, and this year we're back in Edinburgh. And uh, so far it's been one-one. And I'm pleased to announce that this year's winner is from Glasgow. Well done. <laughs> Initial vote uh, in terms of the breakdown, there were 20 people voting yes for the motion that parents should have an absolute right to ha uh, have access and retain information, and 14 were no. And Glasgow persuaded people to move um, so that uh, 15 uh, then said yes, but 20 then said no. So, well done. Very well done. Twice for the winners. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Which means that it's a good thing to play for next year when Edinburgh then goes to Glasgow and it's your turn to host. <laughs>